Your Excellency Lexi Shekedi, President of the Democratic Republic of Congo and outgoing Chairperson of the African Union. Your Excellency Macky Sall, President of the Republic of Senegal and an incoming Chairperson of the African Union. Your Excellency Musa Faki Mohamed, Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Distinguished Ministers, Commissioners, Excellencies Ambassadors, Invited Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. At the outset, let me welcome you all to the land of origins on behalf of the people and government of Ethiopia. Let me also take this opportunity to celebrate our reunion in Addis Ababa after a two-year disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. In this regard, I wish to express my appreciation to the entire leadership of our union and particularly to His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa for providing exemplary leadership in our collective response to the challenge of the pandemic. Over the past two years, we have struggled not only against the human cost of the pandemic, but also an inequitable system of vaccine distribution, arbitrary travel bans, border closures, lockdowns, and misinformation about the value of vaccines. Most importantly, as Africans, we have also learned that cooperation and collaboration is vital, not only for our health, but also for our collective survival. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, our union has committed to undertake ambitious plans designed to transform our continent and create the Africa we want. We want a prosperous Africa based on sustainable and equitable development. We want a politically united continent that aspires to fulfill the ideals of Pan-Africanism and the vision of an African Renaissance. Fulfilling our aim of birthing the Africa we want through robust implementation of Agenda 2063 and its flagship project will require us to make extraordinary efforts collectively. Our theme for 2022 is nutrition and food security. Over the past year, acute food insecurity in Africa has increased by over 60% as the effect of COVID-19 continues to aggravate our fragile economy. Floods, droughts, desert locusts, and other climate-related natural disasters have increased food insecurity for millions of our citizens. With 60% of the world's arable land in Africa, it is of utmost importance that we need to use our natural asset to maximize agricultural outputs and feed our people without reliance on external systems. In the past two years, Ethiopia has made substantial investment in intensifying in summer wheat production through irrigation. Our farmers have been able to control and manage production factors to maximize yields using irrigation. Nationally, we have attained production of over 20 million quintals of irrigation wheat farmed on over 500,000 hectares. This has generated nearly 60 billion in income to our farmers. These efforts are generating great results and will, in the imaginable future, leading to contribute to our food security and self-sufficiency despite the climate variability our region is confronted with. One of the toughest challenges we face in Ethiopia is dealing with the effect of deforestation. While a century ago, Ethiopia's forest coverage was 75%. Over the past two decades, our forest coverage standards are just 4%. We believe 
afforestation is one of the most effective ways of climate change mitigation. Beginning in 2019, we launched a major reforestation initiative under the slogan Green Legacy. Our aim was to plant 20 billion trees across the country over the course of a four-year period. In a mere three years, we managed to plant 18 billion seed leaves. And, and this year, with the Green Legacy Initiative in its final year, we will not only meet our national target, but plan to surpass the target by reaching 25 billion. Additionally, through this initiative, we have sent seedlings to neighboring countries to inspire regional efforts. If we can collaborate to spread the message of Green Legacy in the continent and implement measures that maximize our food security and self-sufficiency, we'll be able to guarantee our citizens the basic necessity of life without reliance on charity. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Africa's voice on the world stage needs to be heard loud and clear. Africa must also be represented on important international bodies. Today, more than seven decades after the creation of the United Nations, Africa remains a junior partner without meaningful input or role in the system of international governance. This is particularly true of the United Nations, where Africa lacks representation on the Security Council and is underrepresented in a variety of ways. It is the right time to reform and revitalize the United Nations system to reflect current global realities and ensure that it is a more representative and equitable body. Only fair representation and transparency in those institutions can usher in a just era in multilateralism. Consistent with our Eslovenian consensus of 2005, we should collectively insist that Africa's reasonable request for no less than two permanent seats and five non-permanent seats in the UN Security Council be adopted. Equally important is Africa's media representation on the international stage. Africa is often portrayed in international media negatively. The endless representation of the continent troubled by civil wars, hunger, corruption, greed, disease and poverty is demeaning and dehumanizing and likely driven by a calculated strategy and agenda. This stereotypical and negative media representation of Africa not only disinforms the rest of the world about our continent, but also shapes the way we see ourselves as Africans, telling our own stories and shaping our own narratives must be our top priority. In this regard, I would like to propose to this August body the establishment of an African Union Continental Media House. This media house could be organized to provide authoritative news and information on our continent, fight disinformation, promote our collective agenda, and offer up opportunities for Pan-African voice to be heard. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, peace and security are a critical issue affecting our continent. Despite the African Union's intensive engagement in addressing peace and security challenges of the continent, guided by the Maxim African solution to African problems, new and complex problems that undermine our unity and sovereignty continue to emerge. In this respect, the past year was particularly challenging to our continent in general and my own country, Ethiopia, in particular. Ethiopia's challenge was internal in nature and a matter of maintaining law and order. But resolution of our internal matters was made exceedingly difficult by the role played by external actors. 
I wish to take this opportunity to thank you all for your support, solidarity and understanding as we underwent these trying times. As you are aware, despite the intransigence of the other side in this conflict, my government has taken a variety of measures to minimize the loss of life and destruction of property. We have implemented unilateral withdrawal from conflict area and used force that is necessary to ensure law and order. As a gesture of goodwill, we have released high-profile suspects with a view of creating conducive environment for peace. We shall leave no stone and turn in our search for peace in our country. Consistent with our commitment to peace, to peaceful resolution of conflict, we have recently launched an inclusive national dialogue platform with formal legislation. Our commitment to pursuing lasting and durable peace in our country shall remain steady fast. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest lesson that Ethiopia has learned over the past year is that without the solidarity of our African brothers and sisters, our existence as a nation would have been at great risk. This affirms the wisdom of our forefathers and foremothers in their dream of Pan-Africanism. The old saying is true, united we stand, divided we fall. Today we stand proud and tall as Africans in the shadow of those who struggled to liberate and unite Africa. Our steadfast unity is the anchor and the foundation of our agenda 2016. A continent of 1.3 billion people, a substantial percentage of them young and dynamic, will drive Africa's prosperity and pull it out of poverty as we set forth in our Agenda 2063. Also, our Continental Free Trade Agreement holds the greatest promise of effectively realizing continental integration and development. The potential for increased intra-Africa trade, free movement of people and investment and self-reliance is a beacon for Africa's renaissance. And instead of depending solely on trade out of Africa, our collective effort to boost intra-Africa trade will protect us from the fluctuation of global economy, economic and political change. Similarly, the potential for continent-wide tourism remains untapped. It is part of aspiration of five of Agenda 2063, which seeks to create an Africa with a strong cultural identity, common heritage, values, and ethics. The more we know each other, the more we are able to cooperate and resist the force that seek to divide and undermine us. You may recall, a mere two months ago, efforts were underway by some in the international community to create an atmosphere of fear to drive expatriates out of Ethiopia and discourage travel to Ethiopia. Those efforts were not successful and will not be successful. Indeed, many fellow Africans joined the Great Ethiopian Diaspora Homecoming Challenge and proved to the world that Ethiopia is a safe and culturally rich tourist destination. As a key pillar of our national reform agenda, tourism potential within Ethiopia has been augmented greatly in the past two years. With many natural endowments developed to complement the historic and cultural heritage that already exists, Ethiopia remains open and welcomes all of our fellow African brothers and sisters. Finally, let me once again convey the warm welcome of the Ethiopian people and reiterate Ethiopia's commitment to do everything in our power to continue to create an enabling environment for the African Union in our collective efforts to deliver the Africa we want through robust implementation of Agenda 2063.
God bless Ethiopia. God bless Africa. Thank you for your attention. I now call upon the Nobel Peace Prize laureate of 2019 to come forward and give his Nobel lecture. Prime Minister. Members of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, fellow Ethiopians, fellow Africans, citizens of the world, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to be here with you today and grateful to the Norwegian Nobel Committee for recognizing and encouraging my contribution to a peaceful resolution of the border dispute between Ethiopia and Eritrea. I accept this award on behalf of Ethiopians and Eritreans, especially those who made the ultimate sacrifice in the cause of peace. Likewise, I accept this award on behalf of my partner and comrade in peace, President Isaiah Saborki, whose goodwill, trust, whose goodwill trust and commitment were vital in ending the two decade deadlock between our countries. I also accept this award on behalf of Africans and citizens of the world for whom the dream of peace has often turned into a nightmare of war. Today, I stand here in front of you talking about peace because of faith. I crawled my way to peace through the dusty tracks of war years ago. I was a young soldier when war broke out between Ethiopia and Eritrea. I witnessed firsthand the agonies of war in frontline battles. There are those who have never seen war but glorify and romanticize it. They have not seen the fear. They have not seen the fatigue. They have not seen the destruction or heartbreak, nor have they felt the mournful witness of war after the carnage. War is the epitome of hell for all involved. I know because I have been there and back. I have seen brothers slaughtering brothers on the battlefield. I have seen older men, women and children trembling in terror under the deadly shower of bullets and artillery shots. You see, I was not only a combatant in war, I was also a witness to its cruelty and what it can do to people. War makes for bitter men, heartless and savage men. Twenty years ago, I was a radio operator attached to an Ethiopian army unit in the border town of Badum. The town was the flashpoint of the war between the two countries. I briefly left the fox wall in the hopes of getting a good antenna reception. It took only but a few minutes, yet upon my return, I was horrified to discover that my entire unit had been wiped out in an artillery attack. I still remember my young comrade in arms who died on that ill-fated day. I think of their families too. During the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, estimated 100,000 soldiers and civilians lost their lives. The aftermath of the war also left untold numbers of families broken. It also permanently shattered communities on both sides. Massive destruction of infrastructure further amplified the post-war economic burden. Socially, the war resulted in mass displacements, loss of livelihoods, deportation, and denationalization of citizens. Following the end of active armed conflict in June 2000, Ethiopia and Eritrea remained deadlocked in stalemate of no war, no peace for two decades. During this period, families were split over borders, unable to see or talk to each other 
for years to come. Tens of thousands of troops remain stationed along both sides of the border. They remained on edge, as did the rest of the country and region. All were worried that any small border clash would flare into a full-blown war once again. As it was, the war and the stalemate that followed were trade for regional peace, with fears that a resumption of active combat between Ethiopia and Eritrea would destabilize the entire home region. And so, when I became Prime Minister about 18 months ago, I felt in my heart that ending the uncertainty was necessary. I believed peace between Ethiopia and Eritrea was within reach. I was convinced that the imaginary world separating our two countries for much too long needed to be torn down. And in its place, a bridge of friendship, collaboration and goodwill has to be built to last for X. That's how I approached the task of building peace, a peace bridge with my partner, President Isaiah Saforki. We were both ready to allow peace to flourish and shine through. We resolved our turn. We resolved our, to turn our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks for the progress and prosperity of our people. We understood our nations are not enemies, and instead we were victims of the common enemy called poverty. We recognized that while our two nations were stuck on all the grievances, the world was shifting rapidly and leaving us behind. We agreed we must work cooperatively for the prosperity of our people and our region. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today we are reaping our peace dividends. Families separated for over two decades are now united. Diplomatic relations are fully restored. Air and telecommunication services have been re-established. And our focus has now shifted to developing joint infrastructure projects that will be a critical lever in our economic ambition. Our commitment to peace between our two countries is ironclad. One may wonder how it is that a conflict extending over 20 years can come to an amicable resolution. Allow me to share with you a little about the beliefs that guide my actions for peace. I believe that peace is an affair of the heart. Peace is a labor of love. Sustaining peace is hard work, yet we must cherish and nurture it. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. For me, nurturing peace is like planting and growing trees. Just like trees need water and good soil to grow, peace requires unwavering commitment, infinite patience, and goodwill to cultivate and harvest its dividends. Peace requires good faith to blossom into prosperity, security, and opportunity. In the same manner, trees absorb carbon dioxide to give us life and oxygen. Peace has a, has a capacity to absorb the suspicion and doubt that may cloud our relationship. In return, it gives back hope for the future, confidence in ourselves, and faith in humanity. The humanity I speak of is within all of us. We can cultivate and share it with others if we choose to remove our masks of pride and arrogance. When our love for humanity outgrows our appreciation of human vanity, then the world will know peace. Ultimately, peace requires an enduring vision, and my vision of peace is rooted in the philosophy of Maddamar. Maddamar, an Amharic word, signifies synergy, convergence, and teamwork for a common destiny. Maddamar is a homegrown idea that is reflected in our political, social, and 
economic life. I like to think of Madamar as a social compact for Ethiopians to build a just, egalitarian, democratic and a human society by pulling together our resources for our collective survival and prosperity. In practice, Madamar is about using the best of our past to build a new society and a new civic culture that thrives on tolerance, understanding and civility. At its core, Madamar is a covenant of peace that seeks unity in our common humanity. It pursues peace by practicing the values of love, forgiveness, reconciliation and inclusion. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I come from a small town called Bashasha, located in the Oromia region of Western Ethiopia. It is in Bashasha that the seeds of Madamar began to sprout. Growing up, my parents instilled in me and my siblings an abiding phase in humanity. Madamar resonates with the proverb, I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper. In my little town, we had no running water, electricity, or paved roads, but we had a lot of love to light up our lives. We were each other's keepers. Faith, humility, integrity, patience, gratitude, tenacity, and cooperation, of course, are like a mighty stream. And we travel together on three country roads called love, forgiveness, and reconciliation. In the Madamar idea, there is no us and them. There is only us for we are all bound by a shared destiny of love, forgiveness, and reconciliation. For the people in the land of origins, in the 13 months of sunshine, Madamar has always been second nature. Ethiopians maintained peaceful coexistence between the followers of the two great religions because we always came together in faith and worship. We, Ethiopians, remained independent for thousands of years because we came together to defend our homeland. The beauty of our Ethiopia is its extraordinary diversity. The inclusiveness of Maddamar ensures no one is left behind in our big extended family. It has also been said, no man is an island. Just the same, no nation is an island. Ethiopia's Madamaran inspired foreign policy pursues peace through multilateral cooperation and good neighborliness. We have an old saying, Basalam and the Tadr Gorabet Salamidar. Yo Ollan Nagayambule. Yo Ollan Nagayambule. Nagambulani. It is a saying. Thank you. It, says, it is a saying shared in many African languages, which means for you to have a peaceful night, you never shall have a peaceful night as well. The sense of this proverb guides the strengthening of relations in the region. We now strive to live with our neighbors in peace and harmony. The Horn of Africa today is a region of strategic significance. The global military superpowers are expanding their military presence in the area. Terrorists and extremist groups also seek to establish a foothold. We, we don't want the Horn to be a battleground for superpowers, nor a hideout for the merchants of terror and brokers of despair and misery. We want the Horn of Africa to become a treasury of peace and progress. Indeed, we want the Horn of Africa to become the Horn of Plenty for the rest of the continent. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
As a global community, we must invest in peace. Over the past few months, Ethiopia has made historic investments in peace, with the returns of which we will see in years to come. We have released all political prisoners. We have shut down detention facilities where torture and vile human rights abuses took place. Today, Ethiopia is highly regarded for press freedom. It is no more a jailer of journalists. Opposition leaders of all political stripes are free to engage in, in peaceful political activity. We are creating an Ethiopia that is second to none in its guarantee of freedoms of expression. We have laid laid the groundwork for genuine multi-party democracy and we will soon hold a free and a fair election. I truly believe peace is a way of life, war a form of death and destruction. Peacemakers must teach peacebreakers to choose the way of life. To that end, we must help build a world culture of peace. But before there is peace in the world, there must be peace in the heart and mind. There... there must be peace in the family, in the neighborhood, in the village, in the towns and cities. There must be peace in and among nations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, there is a big price for enduring peace. A famous protest slogan that proclaims no justice, no peace, calls to mind that peace thrives and bear fruit when planted in the soil of justice. The disregard for human rights has been the source of much strife and conflict in the world. The same holders in our continent, Africa. It is estimated that some 70% of Africa's population is under the age of 30. Our young men and women are crying out for social and economic justice. They demand equality of opportunity and an end to organized corruption. The youth insist on good governance based on accountability and transparency. If we deny our youth justice, they will reject peace. Standing on this world stage today, I would like to call upon all my fellow Ethiopians to join hands and help build a country that offers equal justice, equal rights, and equal opportunities for all its citizens. I would like to specially express that we should avoid the path of extremism and division powered by politics of exclusion. Our accord hangs in the balance of inclusive politics. The evangelists of hate and division are wreaking a havoc in our society using social media. They are preaching the gospel of revenge and retribution on the airwaves. Together, we must neutralize the toxin of hatred by creating a civic culture of consensus-based democracy, inclusivity, civility, and tolerance based on Madamar principles. The art of building peace is a synergistic process to change hearts and minds, beliefs and attitudes that never cease. It is like the work of struggling farmers in my beloved Ethiopia. Each season, they prepare the soil, sow seeds, and control pests. They work the fields from dawn to dusk in good and bad weather. The, season, the seasons change, but their work never ends. In the end, they harvest the abundance of 
their fields. Before we can harvest peace dividends, we must plant seeds of love, forgiveness, and reconciliation in the hearts and minds of our citizens. We must pull out the weeds of discord, hate, and misunderstanding, and toil every day during good and bad days too. I am inspired by a biblical scripture which reads, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Equally, <laughs> equally, I am also inspired by a Holy Quran verses which reads, Humanity is but a single brotherhood, so make peace with your brother. I am Thank you very much. Thank you. I am committed to toil for peace every single day and in all seasons. I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper too. I have promises to keep before I sleep. I have miles to go on the road of peace. As I conclude, I call upon the international community to join me and my fellow Ethiopians in our Madamara inspired efforts of building enduring peace and prosperity in the Horn of Africa. Salam, Laulachin, Nagain, Mundakin Yavato, peace shall be upon all of us. Thank you very much. Pleasure for me uh, to invite uh, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, uh, Mr. Ahmed, uh, here uh, with us um, today. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, is already a truly uh, historical uh, person uh, in uh, Ethiopia. Those that have followed Ethiopia uh, for decades, more have happened in the last months with this Prime Minister. Grateful for the opportunity to share 
with you Ethiopians renewed vision and sustained commitment to positive reforms. Ethiopia is today among the fastest growing economies in the world, consistently averaging over 9% growth in the last decade. Ethiopia's GDP has multiplied tenfold in 25 years, poverty has been halved, and educational enrollment has markedly increased. Significant investment in infrastructure has contributed to the growth and attracted foreign direct investment, making Ethiopia one of the leading foreign direct investment destinations in Africa. These are tremendous success and reflect the real commitment of our government and our people to development and progress. Our challenges, however, remain formidable. To reform and to enforce our upward trajectory and achieve even more rapid and sustainable growth, Ethiopia has embarked on a comprehensive reform process since last April, which cuts across politics, economics, and society. We aim to establish a virtuous cycle between these elements and among us our partners to enable us to meet our challenges in a mutually profitable manner. Ladies and gentlemen, Allow me to explain this virtuous path of reform. And our reform is deeply rooted in the philosophy of Madama, an Amharic word for coming together or synergy. Madama is a historic reform to organic change and is building on the gains of the past while reminding us of our rich heritage. It also reflects on modern realities, strengthening the synergy in politics, economics, technology, and society. Ethiopia is indeed undergoing a period of political and economic renaissance. The Madama reform is people-centered and has three interdependent pillars. The first pillar is a vibrant democracy. The second one is economic vitality. And the third pillar is regional integration and openness to the world. Today, we meet at a time of great opportunity for Ethiopia and for you. In this spirit of partnership, please allow me to briefly address each of these aspects. On the political front, we are working tirelessly the constitutional promise of building a democratic and pluralistic political order based on our first pillar, a vibrant democracy. Guided by this principle, we have acted quickly and decisively. In the past nine months alone, we have released all political prisoners in the thousands. We have also invited individuals and groups based on abroad to return home and join us in a spirit of positive sum, not zero sum politics. We have restored license to independent media, issued an amnesty law, and repealed restrictive laws of the past. We will also have a revised civil society law very soon. We believe. It is not possible to sustain growth, attract investment, and allow all Ethiopians to benefit from the growth dividend without embracing democracy and persuading the world to invite to invest in our economy. In sum, we see democracy and development as interlinked and we have acted decisively on this understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, the second pillar of our reform is economic vitality. We are 
determined to bring Ethiopia firmly into the center of the international market. To do so, we will leverage the collective power of our people, especially women and the youth, and build the private sector to drive more inclusive and socially sustainable growth. We cannot hope to progress as a nation and as an economy if we disqualify half of our population from full and equal participation. Women are now occupying key government positions, including the Minister of Defense, Minister of Trade, Minister of Transport, and the newly established Minister of Peace. We have achieved gender parity in our government. We now have the first woman as the President of the Federal Supreme Court, and recently our parliament has elected the first woman head of state in modern Ethiopia. This is important progress, but it is not enough. Ethiopia is a large market of over 100 million people, of which 60 million are under the age of 24. With half a million school leavers annually, our core objective is to sustain fast-paced economic growth and to create both more and better jobs. We must create the condition to enable a demographic dividend and to harness the potential of our young and energetic population. To do so, we have to invest in the aspirations of our youth by improving educational standards and create fresh opportunities through careful planning and strategic repositioning. This requires unleashing the potential of the private sector. Here are four steps that we are taking to make this not mere rhetoric but a firm reality. First, we will make it easier for small and medium-sized enterprises to grow and flourish since they are the engine room of our economy. We are reprioritizing access to credit for SMEs since two-thirds of our SMEs report not having access to finance. Second, we will ease and mainstream regulations needed to start a business and provide a better policy environment. We will make it easier to do business for everyone who wishes to invest in our country. Ethiopia is undergoing significant institutional reforms and is reviewing its investment code, commercial code and other business regulations to enhance the ease of doing business in Ethiopia and increase our global competitiveness. Third, we will make the private sector an integral part of our economy, as it should be. Ethiopia is committed to reforming its state's own enterprises and crowding in more private capital. We are committed to opening up the economy to international investors in telecom, logistics, energy, aviation, railways, and industrial parks. This has the added benefit of creating the space to reallocate government expenditure to, sh to social services. We are confident that international capital and expertise will deliver significant value for Ethiopians and contribute to our development agenda. Fourth, we will continue to foster public-private partnerships as we see this as more than merely a business proposition and a deal to be struck. We see it as the way to build balanced long-term partnership aimed at triggering faster economic growth and profit. At the same time, we will ensure our citizens realize their full potential and live a prosperous 
healthy and safe life. We therefore look to the next generation of public-private partnerships to be more balanced in delivering growth and the yield and representing a fresh way to contemplate the relationship between business and government and offering a shared formula for social and economic growth and inclusiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, the third and the final pillar of our renaissance is regional integration and openness to the world. Regional integration and trade will be crucial to the future of our continent, allowing us to grow beyond primary commodities and accelerate our development. Addis Ababa is a seat of the African Union and so must lead by example. Our determination explains our active engagement in discussions on the African continental free trade area and our sense of urgency to finalize Ethiopia's accession to the World Trade Organization. History has demonstrated time and again that neighbors with intimate, rule-based and diverse trade and economic relations are unlikely to resort to conflict. That is why we believe integration must be viewed not just as an economic project but also as crucial to securing peace and reconciliation in the Horn of Africa. The adage from our ancestor is, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. In this spirit, Ethiopia has ended two decades of military settlements with Eritrea and is enhancing cooperation with neighboring countries and reconfiguring the geopolitics in our region. Ethiopia believes that an Africa at peace with itself can counteract the chaotic push of mass migration. As such, Ethiopia aims to increase the influx of smart capital into African continent. There is a strong case to be made for investing in our continent. Even the most conservative asset allocation of an investment portfolio should prudently consider this option. If just 2% of the 40 trillion USD in OECD pension assets were invested into Africa over the coming five years, it would exceed the total foreign direct investment that we have seen in the last five years by more than three times. For investors considering the record of return, this offers higher than average rewards and diversification of risk. For Ethiopia, it would catal cat catalyze transformation. To realize this great opportunity, we appreciate the fundamental need to de-risk our politics and the economics, which would reduce the premiums out by prospective investors. Part of that process is to build trust and confidence and to lead by example. I believe that our record over the last year shows this to be so. Dear friends, let me conclude. Ethiopia has embraced a great vision and embarked on bold reforms. Improving the political environment and the business climate is our priority. Building an open society and a vibrant economy is our shared aspiration and our proposition to you, but we must all act fast. Our record for the last nine months should illustrate our results. This is an, this is an agenda for action, a blueprint for a model of virtuous and sustainable growth. Looking at what we have accomplished in less than a year, I am optimistic and excited about the opportunities that are ahead. Ethiopians are born runners and we excel in marathons. Take it as a signal of our intention and level of commitment and stamina. Now is our time. Rating agencies forecast, and I quote, that growth will average 
20% over 2018 to 2021, making Ethiopia the fastest growing of the sovereign we read. I say to you, Carpe Diem, yes, seize a day, but also trust the future. Come and see what we are offer and invest in our potential. Whether you are an entrepreneur, a CEO, or an industrialist, or just a lover of nature, or history, or beauty, Ethiopia has something for you. I thank you. leaders could learn maybe even in Europe huh <laughs> some uh, nine months ago the um, situation in Ethiopia as you have stated was very bad the mere possibility of uh, state collapse mainly due to the government's uh, response from public political and economic demand push the nation into dangerous wars. What makes the situation more dangerous was the poor relationship among the leadership. There was misunderstanding, mistrust and mutual suspicion among the top, the top leadership. Due to this problem, we collect data from different sources, we analyze using different techniques and mechanisms and definitely if you use different sources and different mechanisms to analyze the information, the output cannot be identical. So having or seeing the problem from a different perspective, we can't uh, find a solution to solve uh, the problem and to change the situation. Uh, to make long story short, when the situation gets worse, we sat for weeks to discuss and to evaluate as a party. Then we have achieved, uh, finally we have achieved leadership change. Yeah. Not only leadership change, but also peaceful a mugshot or your version of Picasso. Which is a very rare experience in Africa. Right after the change, the new leadership decided to, uh, to, to listen from the public, the opinion, the grievances, so as to make a communal solution problem at that time. Then we have discussed with almost all corner of the country. We have uh, traveled and we have discovered the public with their grievances and their uh, demands. Mainly their demand where uh, they complained about the government, uh, about our decision, also the widespread uh, injustice was in politics and economics as well We didn't undermine the public grievance. We just sat and evaluate all questions which came across the country. So we prioritize to fix some of the problems in Philippines and others in institutional reform. Like I mentioned before, we uh, automatically lifted the state of emergency. That was one of the questions of the public. And released thousands of prisoners. single journalist 
it's also rare these days, huh? If if you are open-minded and open-hearted, you can learn. It's not bad sometimes to learn from Africa as well. Anyways, not only this, we also uh, invite all opposition parties. Uh, we are based abroad. Uh, not only opposition party, but also, also waged armed struggle against uh, the government. Uh, they all are back now. We don't have any opposition party abroad. We are discussing how to change the political landscape and how to make the upcoming election democratic, free, and um, a better one compared to the previous one. These kinds of action change the mind of many Ethiopians that the hope is there, the past the of change uh, also there.